Hey, y'all. I'm Sunny Shell, and tonight I'm thrilled to have Dr. Greg Layden back on the show. We're going to talk about climate change. So sit back, buckle up, and let's get to the sunny spot on Skeptic Haven. Lay great stress on. It wasn't enough, he said, to enshrine some rights in a, in a constitution or a bill of rights. The people had to be educated and they had to practice their skepticism and their education. Otherwise, we don't run the government. The government runs us. Good evening, everyone. I'm so thankful y'all are here to spend your Thursday with me. Tonight, I'm happy to have Dr. Greg Layden back on the show. Dr. Layden is a biological anthropologist. He received his BA from the Regents College Program and his master's and PhD from Harvard University. Welcome, Greg. Hi, thanks for having me on. Good to see you again. Absolutely. I'm, I'm very happy to have you on. We have a very interesting show tonight. Uh, the first thing I want to ask you, though, is what is the biological anthropologist doing talking about climate change? Yeah, actually, it's almost the opposite, because in my own personal history, I was an archaeologist before I did any bioanthropology, and I was doing North American archaeology. And I moved to the Boston area to work at Harvard's Institute of Conservation Archaeology from New York. And therefore, I moved next to the ocean and I was doing archaeology on the seashore and uh, realized that climate change, a long term climate change was incredibly important. If, if anyone wants to know more about it, go to a Google map, like open a tab now in your browser if you're watching this, go to oh, go to Google Maps, look at the eastern end of the United States so you can see Maine and Florida and put it on satellite view and you'll see this big giant flat thing off the coast. It's a really huge region of relatively shallow flat before you get to the actual ocean. That was all exposed. That was dry land at the time that Native Americans first came, showed up there. And then for several thousand years, the sea level rose and tra transversed that landscape until it got to where it is now. And a lot of prehistory has to be understood in the coast, understood with the idea that it was a constant rising of sea level going on for several thousand years. And I, I was faced with that doing archaeology. So I got really interested in, that's, that's sort of big scale climate change, right? That's the melting of the end of the, the end of the ice age. And then when I eventually decided to study human evolution, I was working with Glenn Isaac as his student. Um, there was a, there were people dabbling with isotopes, stable isotopes that you can use to do all, you can do all kinds of things with stable isotopes, tagging things and looking at dietary change and looking at, at um, climate issues. And, uh, the, and other people looking at what's called the Milankovitch cycles, which is this ancient idea that because of the way the earth tilts and the way the eccentricity of the orbit works around the sun, we have periods that are more likely to be ice ages and periods that are less likely to be ice ages. And the, the person interpreting the Milankovitch ideas in relation to the isotopes and well, there were a bunch of scientists all at once, Shackleton, Embry, Broker, there were so many names, you can go look them up. And my advisor was a, a superstar in archaeology. And he brought them all together one weekend from England, South Africa, Australia, and California, and so on, and had a mini conference with just us, just his students and the super experts, which explained to us, we've there's been a convergence of ideas, and we now understand climate change in a way we never really understood it before. And after that is all the stuff you hear about now it really comes from that, like that one meeting. And I was fascinated by it. So I've always, and then Glenn sadly died, and Ofer Bar Yosef, the, the um, archaeologist who's worked in the Tufian period in Israel, became the professor in charge of that lab. And he's the guy who put together the idea that the melting of glaciers shut off the Atlantic conveyor system in North, uh, Northern Atlantic, the North Atlantic, which caused a return of the Ice Age temporarily known as the Younger Dryas, which instituted, or it, which instigated the beginnings of agriculture in the Near East. So these are ideas a lot of your listeners will have heard of. And that was happening in the lab I was working in. So I was really interested in it. And then somewhere in there, I ended up, because graduate students in anthropology don't get money. Like we have to have jobs. Like you right. don't get funding really. I mean, if you're, you can go overseas and get funding, but you can't be at home and get funding. So I, I got a job editing a newspaper uh, monthly. I won't tell you what the newspaper was about. It, well, I'll tell you, it was a new Asian newspaper. We had like psychics and stuff as our columnist. <laughs> <laughs> and seriously, and, and uh, it was just, I did it for the money. And so I, I, I figured I had to balance this out. So I wrote science articles every month. 
and I figured I'd write, I wrote several, because I was the editor, I could write whatever I wanted. So I wrote, I wrote a series of five, this was in the 1980s, I wrote a series of five articles on global warming. And there wasn't much being talked about regarding global warming at the time. So um, it was, you know, but no one read this newspaper, so it didn't matter. But I, I've always, so that led me to just having, always having an interest in it. I actually have a peer reviewed article I'll co-authored on ocean heat. So I, I do have credit, minor credentials as a climate scientist, but mainly I've been writing about climate science and climate science nihilism on my blog and in other places. Um, I'm writing for the messenger lately these days, some op-eds are taking them and um, just talking about. So my overall interest in science outside of doing science is fine, is taking things that are kind of complicated and, ex and getting them into a form that's digestible by anybody who's interested without watering it down or making stuff up too much anyway. And so, <laughs> and, and so I, and I've been doing that, I've been doing that with climate science for years now. And I have good friends and colleagues like Mike Mann and, and others who are like leaders in their field. And if, if, if I write about something, it's always after I have run, I've, I've learned from these climate scientists, what this, what the science is. I've, I've learned it. I would talk about messaging and how to explain things. So I pretty much vet what I, what I'm writing. I don't vet the things I, I wrote, but this, I write from a place of like a sem, an ongoing seminar with five or six colleagues, uh, John Abraham and Mike, Mike Mann and others who are, uh, who know about, who know about the science and know how to explain it. That's fascinating. I, I will say that I'm really jealous that you got to have that like mini conference with just uh, your, your fellow students and your instructor and those wonderful people. Cause that's like, a once in a lifetime opportunity, really. I and mean, that, that's fantastic. I'm, I'm yeah. totally jealous about that. Yeah, it, it really was amazing. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> so what, when we're talking about climate change, I think a lot of people don't really understand what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. I hear on the news a lot from right-wing pundits that, of course, the climate is changing. It's called the seasons, you know, right. those type of things. So I really want to get your and um, uh, I want you to help us to understand what we mean when we're talking about mm -hmm. climate change. Sure, really good question. And okay, first of all, a really important part of that phrase is climate. So the climate is not seasons, but in order to describe the climate of a region, you would describe the seasons. So we have winter with snow in some places, and there's no snow in other places. So there's some regions have a dry season and a wet season. Um, those are the seasonality of 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 a region is part of the overall climatology. But the way, the, the, the best way to understand it is to think of the word climatology as meaning the average rainfall cycle, as a rainfall cycle changes throughout the year, average amount of snow, average temperature, average winds, average anything else that the weather, from the weather that we're interested in over a 30 year period. Now, often we have to use a 20 year period, but the climatology is the multi-decade pattern of a given region. Climate change is when that pattern changes. And so you can imagine the climatology of where I am. I am in uh, in the western suburbs of, of Minneapolis, which is in, in Minnesota. Um, the, the climatology where I am 12,000 years ago was there was a mile of ice and a mile thick glacier. And I don't know what was going on on top of that glacier, but it was, okay, I'm, I'm at a, I'm in a low, the low plains here, right? We're not that far above sea level. But if you're at top of a glacier that's a mile thick, that's like being in Denver, <clears throat> only you're on ice, and it's a, and it's the ice age. So the climatology must have been like always cold, probably above freezing briefly in the summer because there could there would still be a strong sun. So there'd be shifting back and forth between melting. There'd be ponds forming and then freezing like there is now in Greenland, but maybe a longer warmer season. I don't know. Uh, maybe there were even plants and dirt up there because these things are ancient and they're there for thousands of years. So you could imagine even being biology, whatever was going on, we don't know now, but it's the 30 year average in 12,000 years ago would be cold and a little snowy. Now we have a, a summer that's quite warm and a, and, a, and a winter that's quite cold and it's a different climatology. So you, you would, you, obviously this changes and that's climate change is big time scale, big changes over time. When we use the word climate change though, these days, um, so, okay. Climatologists are very interested these days mainly in what's in the phenomenon of global warming. And global, anthropogenic global warming 
is the is caused by the human activities that either release carbon from places where it's been stored as a solid on earth surfaces including agricultural areas etc or from fossil fuels mainly from fossil fuels and as the carbon is released from solid form, it turns into carbon dioxide as a process of burning, which creates carbon dioxide. And the carbon dioxide molecules are uh, are not invisible to the sun energy that's coming, landing on the earth and bouncing off and going back into space. These molecules are not invisible to it. So the light enters the molecules and is absorbed by them, by the atoms in there temporarily, and then sent out again at different wavelength, a lower wavelength. So it ends up creating local heat that stays there for a while and so it's almost like imagine having a, a space heater in a room and you can feel it from 20, 15 feet away but if you put a hang a blanket in front of it you don't feel that heat anymore mm -hmm. and it's really warm on the other side of the blanket right so right now the upper atmosphere is quite cool compared to what it was 100 years ago and the lower atmosphere is quite warm compared to what it was a couple hundred years ago because of this blanketing effect what happens then is the additional heat from the carbon dioxide changes the dynamics of water. More of the water is sitting in vapor form because it's simply warmed more evaporation and less freezing and so on. So you end up with more water in the vapor form and water itself, water vapor is another climate is another uh, greenhouse gas. It also does what the carbon dioxide does. So carbon dioxide basically recruits vapor and between the two of them, it really warms up the surface of the planet. Um, but in order to understand how that works, you've got to understand how the climate works how the planet works. In order to understand how the planet works, you have to build complicated mathematical models. You're running computers that you test by seeing how they match the ancient record of climate. Mm -hmm. So modern people, modern scientists studying global warming almost always study ancient climates also hmm. because we have to understand them. So that's, that's what climate change is. That's what global warming specifically is. Well, you have sparked several questions that I now have that I wasn't even thinking about before, but we do have some questions from uh, the chat. So the first one is from Trevor Gillis. I'd like to know how much the climate has warmed in the last 50 years. I think that's a great question. Um, yeah, I don't know. The, the, uh, I don't know the exact numbers. It, it, the, the climate has gone up something like a, a little over a degree, close to a degree and a half since the initial releasing of car carbon from carbon sources in the 18th century. And of course, corresponding to that, we've had an increase of about a foot sea level rise globally wow. and average. Um, the 50 years, the last, there's been a lot more increase in the, 50, the last 50 years, but it's riding on top of, you know, when you, if you burn a bunch of fuel and release several tons of carbon into the atmosphere in 1800, that carbon dioxide is still there and it's been warming the planet since then. The same amount of carbon dioxide released last week hasn't done anything yet. So we, it's, hmm. it's very easy to forget the older pre-industrial or early industrial and industrial age carbon and focus on the last dec few decades. So I don't pay attention to the last 50 years. I'm thinking more of the last 150 to 200 years, which has been. And so and our records, our good records start in 1850. So by 1850, there was already warming happening. Wow. So, yeah. So I'm going to, well, I need to try to remember this, but I'm, maybe I'll go ahead really quickly and do Carrie's. I don't want to forget what I was going to ask. You just sparked something with me, but Carrie Ann Chrysler asked, she actually has two questions. The first one, how does the destruction of natural ecosystems affect global warming? Another great question. Yes. Well, it's, and that's actually the hardest thing to answer. So, for example, uh, there are studies that show that when you warm the surface up a little bit, when the climate when it just gets like some region has natural habitats and in the natural habitats, there's you know, soil and plants growing in the soil and there's organisms in the, in the soil and there's nutrients in the soil and so on. It's a whole cycle of everything, right? The usual cycle of carbon and nitrogen and so on. When you warm things up a little bit, um, a very common re reaction is pl uh, plants, because there's more carbon dioxide, there might be more plant growing activity. But mm -hmm. things, things are warmer, it might change the amount of, of carbon that's that's retained in the soil. The, car, the soil may lose some of its carbon. Um, and uh, that will depend, the, the amount of carbon in the soil is partly dependent upon biological activity, microbial activity. 
So you can actually have a scenario where you warm things up and increase the ability of soil to, to hold carbon, and then you decrease the ability of soil to hold carbon. <clears throat> and uh, I can cite a dozen studies that show it's almost chaotic. Like what really what really happens is not that clear as far as just general overall natural environment is changing because of warming. Um, but what we do along the way is the question is about dest destroying natural ecosystems directly. So you cut down forests. Forests are a big carbon sink. Those trees are all carbon holding things. Uh, when you plant, plant plants with shallow roots, like a lot of our agriculture, we have uh, corn and stuff. They have shallow roots. And so this ecosystem with the biota, biota of, of microbes and roots and so on normally might be three, four, five feet deep in like a prairie land. When you change it into corn land, it's four or five, six inches deep. Mm -hmm. And that's significantly less carbon holding capacity. So corn fields hold almost no carbon and prairies hold piles of carbon that have been developing in that prairie for thousands of years. And then, so when you make it into corn field, that carbon goes into the air and it stops going back in. Um, the total amount of carbon dioxide contribution from this agriculture though, is, is less than, is a fraction probably of what is released by the farmers using machines to make the corn. Right. Okay. It's, it's a lot of people uh, worry, focus on soil and it is really important, but when we revert to soil to uh, forever green agriculture, where you have actually deep root plants grown in with the shallow root plants, uh, we, we get back some of that carbon storage, but it's, it's not as significant as it would be if you just made every farmer use electric tractors. Wow, that, that's fascinating. And oh gosh, I just have so many questions now. I'll go on to, to Carrie's next question. What damages are done by man-made surfaces, cement, pavement, buildings, etc., with the heat absorption and constant release throughout the night, which is naturally a cooling period? <clears throat> yeah. That's also an active area of research. I don't know that much about that exactly. I know that um, I know that cities have heat islands. I, I, there was a study I read a while back that suggested that if um, you took a city like San Francisco, which is in a warmer, slightly warmer climate than other cities, um, and painted every roof white, it would reduce its heat island effect and kind of balance it out by reflecting the sunlight off. Um, so, so paving things with cement might change the dynamics of the air and and the I guess I should back up a little bit and just note you know if you dig in the ground you'll find that the earth is warm I mean mm -hmm. it's not compared to the universe <laughs> it's like 45 degrees or something it's like and you and it's consistently so it depends on where you every place you dig you will find a different temperature but it stays consistent down there and where does the heat come from the heat comes from the sun a lot of people might imagine it comes from the molten core of the earth but it doesn't that's that's insulated. There's heat below the ground. I mean, there is heat down there. You can dig down and you can find heat from the volcanic. Most places you dig and the heat that you find, if you're going to put in a, 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 you know, a heat transfer system to heat your house and you dig a trench and put a pipe in there, that heat's coming from the sun. The sun warms the earth down several feet, but very, very slowly and very little. So it takes like forever to do that. It's obviously been going on forever. When you pave, you're going to change the dynamics of that probably. But the bigger effect is probably making the concrete and placing concrete there instead of trees and, and grass. So it's no, it's no longer a, a trap and the concrete produces giant amounts of CO2 output. There's ways to do that with less. There's like, you know, there's ways to make concrete without doing that. But that's, that's how we do it now. So um, I think the habitat destruction is more significant than the effect on climate. So with all of that that you just said, um, one of the first questions that I had um, for you is you had said that the the um, effect of carbon really goes back 150 years. Yeah. That that's that what was released then is still in the air. And so you're not really thinking about the last 50 years. You're thinking more about the last 150 years. Yeah. So my question is, um, is there any real hope of us reversing the devastating effects that human induced global climate change is going to have? Because it seems like since we have been using so much carbon, we've been introducing so much carbon into the atmosphere and we've been removing all uh, or a lot of those carbon collectors. Right. Then in the next 50 to 100 years, it's going to be the effects of what we're doing now. Correct? Okay. 
now you're actually you were, we were talking before about what we're going to talk about and I'm sorry <laughs> and, and you're going to ask about what's new and that's what's new okay so i'll, I'll we'll save that then <laughs> oh yeah we can save it we can save it or i can do it now if you want oh, well we can go ahead then because that question was okay. what is the latest news from the climate that's, change front so. <laughs> so i can go ahead right now so okay here's the deal imagine the scenario where we add greenhouse gases to the atmosphere um that the atmosphere atmosphere is not going to heat up instantaneously it's going to take a while, but the atmosphere will eventually reach. Let's say we just re add some add some CO two and stop. We just increase the CO two and stop. So it's mm -hmm. sitting there in the atmosphere. Um, the atmosphere then takes a while to warm up, and then it reaches equilibrium. Now it's warm. It stays that at that temperature, new temperature. Okay. Me and the other thing that happens is if you put all that CO two in the atmosphere in one burst, the CO two will eventually go away. Um, because plants turn it into carbon right. containing compounds and eventually it will go away. There, uh, there's uh, for that first part, how long does it take to equilibrate also means how warm will it get? So you put 50 parts per million in the atmosphere, it was, it's going to go up like three tenths of a degree Celsius um, over a hundred years, or is it going to go up over 200 years, like three degrees, like what's going to happen. And that is the most complicated scientific question ever asked about anything bigger than a cell probably the research that's needed to understand that question requires understanding all the things we talked about already what are all the plants doing what all the soils doing was oceans doing and we know we knew we now know more about the ocean than ever but we've known not enough about the ocean what the ocean does to carbon dioxide we don't know what the ocean does to heat that was what my paper was on um we know i'm not saying why well, saying we don't know i don't mean we don't know i mean we know less than we want we know less than we want about the transfer of heat. We know less than we want to know about all these things. So 10 years ago, it was perfectly reasonable to say, because there was a good set of models that suggested that if we stopped adding CO2 to the atmosphere right then, the heating would continue on another half a degree Celsius or some large amount. And so the doomsday is set. We just haven't gotten there yet. And then when we get there, it will take hundreds of years to equilibrate and go away. Okay. We now, there was at the same time, other people were saying, no, the CO2, the atmosphere adjusts heat wise to CO2 really fast. So when you, when, and, and then other science was saying, you know, the CO2 can go way fast when it's in the atmosphere, it can actually go away. Some of us, some of our, our CO2 from 200 years ago is still there, but a lot of it's gone. It's, it's, it's cycles, obviously, but it, it can, the amounts can reduce faster than you think. Both of those have now equilibrated into a new, what we now believe, what the consensus now says. This is hinted in the last IPCC report. I think it's described in Michael Mann's latest book that came out like three days ago, um, uh, that when you stop polluting, you stop the warming. That is extremely good news because it means we don't have to say, let's stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere. We're all going to die anyway, but we die less severely or whatever, but rather if we stop putting CO2 in the atmosphere now, the, the heat, the, the heating will stop increasing right away. Like right away, meaning, you know, it's not a hundred years. It's not 50 years. It's like a couple of years. Wow. It's a rapid equilibrium. It equilibrates rapidly. And wow. then the CO2 stays loose. It stays loose, but it gets sucked into the ocean faster than we were thinking, which is not good changes the ocean chemistry and it can, you know, it's still, it's still in the system, but the atmospheric CO2, the ocean will draw down the atmospheric CO2 more than we were thinking. Probably that's a little bit less certain than the stop. When we stop putting CO2 out, it will stop warming really fast. I mean, the warming we have now will continue, but it won't increase the, the temperature will stay high, but it, it won't keep rising. So the doomsday scenario of, the, the CO2 we have now is enough to, to cause killer temperatures in 30 years, even if we stop putting CO2 in the environment. That's not true anymore. That's the, that, that, well, it was never true. That we now, the consensus now is, is that we don't think that that's the case. And this okay. is a slowly evolving thought in the consensus in climate science. So, climate scientists hearing this will go, yeah, we knew that like a few years ago, but <laughs> most people don't. And it's kind of good news. Okay.
Um, Kat, I'm going to be asking that question a little bit later on. It's actually one of one of my questions already, so I'll get to you soon. Um, but I actually have a few more questions I wanted to ask you. So, uh, first of all, with this, um, with the ocean collecting all of that faster than we thought. Yeah. And you said that's not exactly good, but what does that mean to our oceans? What yeah. changing the the chemistry and the the climate of the oceans will that be just as devastating as the heating? I don't I don't know. I don't think we know. I know <laughs> I I think that we're losing a corals. We're losing corals. I don't yes. see why the corals aren't going to be mostly wiped out. Um, they might change. They might might maybe other places will have different corals. Um, you know, there might still be coral somewhere. They might change. Uh, uh, we did have okay. Warming, warming hurts corals more than acidity right now. So a few years, uh, the last, in the last 15 years, we've had two major El Nino events mm -hmm. that devastated corals each time. But then the corals kind of came back somewhat after each one. I mean, I'm not saying, I don't know how much they came back. Depends on the coral reef you look at. Um, so the heating from, from El Nino wipes out the corals. But then when it chills down again, the corals can come back that's more heat than it is co2 there's more as it's not acidification as much but acidification can be very local i mean it's it's very it, the acidity of the ocean is not uniform it depends on upwelling and all kinds of currents and stuff so there will be places that become extremely acidified and dangerously so deadly so in terms of the local biota uh, the, the you know algae and everything else will be changed um but every time we have an el nino it's like getting into a tardis and traveling ahead a few years Right. That's the heat that we're going to have normally in 15 years from now that we have now. So the the, ble the bleaching out of corals due to heat during the last few El Ninos, and I don't know what's going on now. We're having El Nino right now, and I don't know what the corals are doing right this second. Right. But they're probably getting nailed. But uh, this is just a, a window into what's going to happen in a decade or whatever as, as the temperature goes up. So um, that's bad. Now, I, I don't want to... I'm saying a number of things that kind of counter. I have a number of things to say tonight. I think that are counter fear. And one of the things I want to counter corals are amazing. They're it's great. It would be horrible to lose them, but they're not. And, and you will see information from Australia, like it's central to the fishing industry in Western Australia, but Western Australia does not really catch as many fish as like the North Atlantic. It's corals are not, they're an extremely diverse environment, not an extremely productive environment. So the amount the amount of fish coming out of corals is way less than the diversity. Now the diversity is important for other reasons, and that's going to be a problem. If we lose coral reefs, we're going to lose how many species survive right. in that leap, and they're and are local. They're like varieties are local. The genetic diversity is enormous. We don't know what the effects can be, and corals may well be. Some coral reefs might be. Well, the coral reef itself is a structure that physically protects a lagoon or other areas and it's a living feature so if the coral reef dies that erodes away especially with increased climate change we may lose major sources of a lot of a lot of fish in the ocean like codfish and stuff they they they, they breed in shallower waters and if the shallower waters are being white are being less protected because of coral reefs dying that's a, that's a whole other problem i don't think we've even looked at that closely so, but so yeah you, you do have kind of a mixed bag here where yeah. you're actually making me feel a heck of a lot better than I have been feeling. I've been very concerned about this. Um, however, we're not out of the woods and no. it's not necessarily all roses and glitter either. We still have some massive things we need to be dealing with. And even if we stop the, uh, you know, emitting all of this um, carbon into the, into the atmosphere, which is not very likely <laughs> to happen, um, you know, we're, it's, we're still going to have these other issues. So um, I'm going to go ahead and get to Kat's question. It, it was on our uh, list anyway. So um, what about the dangers of the permafrost? Okay. Yeah. So this idea is, um, the idea is that per, uh, permafrost, both, okay, permafrost, it's not just permafrost, but permafrost in the Northern regions is it is a place where a large amount of, bio, of biological matter is trapped in a in frozen state and it's in the process of turning into carbon dioxide or methane and it has done so in the past and in other words it, carbon dioxide itself and methane itself may actually be trapped in there with it so if you take a bunch of permafrost and unfreeze it it's it's a it's a source of methane 
right. and a source of carbon dioxide. Now, I think there are things happening in those regions that are really mysterious and weird. Uh, these are areas that were previously glacier, glaciated in many cases. So mm -hmm. if you go like where I am, like right when I look out my window, there's a, a swamp out there, a marsh. And it is a place where there probably was a giant chunk of ice stuck in the, there was ice with dirt. And then as the ice melted, it became dirt with ice. Right. And then it's dirt with not much ice. And where the ice is sitting there and melts away like 7,000 years ago, 3,000 years after the glacier's gone, a, a lake forms. Mm -hmm. Okay. So if you look at, at Canada, it's like round holes everywhere in those regions, right? Round holes everywhere full of water. And there's places, I think, where there's lots of that, those caves and holes that are up in the Siberian and Canadian Arctic that are, um, every once in a while these holes show up, like they've been showing up at a high frequency lately. And, um, and some of them might be like filled with methane. So there's places where you can like light a match and light the air that's on the ground and it burns from the methane coming out of, perma, of melting permafrost. Okay. So a lot of methane coming out. The other concern is this methane rock, methane under certain conditions of pressure and temperature forms a, forms a, a solid. And, and there's nodules of methane all along the, the surface of the ocean at that depth. There's a lot of, lot of, a lot of it down there. And some of it, most of it's really deep, but some of it happens to be because of temperature in the, in the regions of the Arctic ocean, it's on the, it's on this, it's on the surface there. And as those oceans warm, as that water warms, that methane dissolves. It's no longer a rock, it's now a gas and it bubbles up. Okay. So this, there's, Definitely CO2 and methane being added to the atmosphere from, from permafrost melting. And that's a lot and it's important and it's, just, it's, it's on the, you know, it's on the pie chart. It's significant. It matters. The, 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 but there's a theory that someone came up with who was not a climate scientist, but an environmentalist who um, came up with a theory that the methane is such a serious greenhouse gas. If enough of it melts, especially off the surface of the ocean, the shallower regions in the Arctic, it will come up in such a, vo a volume that it might cause instantaneous global warming that's really, really fast, which then melts the methane faster and you end up with everyone literally dying. Literally, right. everyone dies. It's a couple of Russian scientists took up this idea and went up and started collecting data and they started producing scary, scary, scary science. And then people heard about this and kind of freaked out about it and it became almost like a cult. The... Um, the uh, uh, it became to the point where if you said, you know, those articles are a little bit, eh, they're they're not really in any peer reviewed journals yet, and I'm not so sure that they're, you know, if you if you questioned it, people would then shun you, because they really wanted to believe in the methane bomb theory, so it became a cult, and so um, whether it's true or not, once you have a cult, something turns into a cult, you got a problem when you're having conversations about it. Absolutely, with the science, it's really clear now. The methane bomb scenario is impossible and can't it won't happen um there's a lot of reasons why it just it just doesn't add up if you look at the amount of methane and the and the warming and everything else you can't tweak the numbers in any way to get a methane bomb that causes a sudden catastrophic warming that then causes more methane melting it just can't happen it just the numbers aren't there it just can't happen. so um it doesn't mean it doesn't contribute to global warming it may well and by the way, methane released from nodules in the ocean, a really high percentage of it is consumed by organisms that love to eat methane in the water. Oh, now that's cool. Yeah, that's <laughs> I cool. I didn't even know that or, was a thing. Yeah, that's what they, yeah, so that's a factor. But, and, and methane also, methane is bad because people say it's 100 times more serious of a greenhouse gas than CO2. That's only the day it's formed. Like if you have some substance and it turns, you know, substance A turns into CO2, substance B turns into methane, the same amount of carbon in both, because they both went through two different processes. The carbon dioxide is bad, the methane is 100 times worse on that day. But the methane really does start breaking down instantly. And it, and it isn't there in several decades. It's not there. Um, it's turned into carbon dioxide, which is still there, but, uh, <laughs> but it's only, but it's only a tiny percentage of, of its carbon dioxide equivalents. Right. So, uh, if you want to make methane scary, you say it's a hundred times worse than carbon dioxide, because that's how it is on when it was formed, but you really got to figure out, this is why this is such a problem. I said in the beginning, it's so hard to figure out what's happening because everything is changing. Every single thing is a moving value. 
So the, the, the significance of methane in the atmosphere changes in its own way over time. And that depends upon other things, like how fast does methane break down? It depends on vapor in the air because it depends on sunlight. Uh, it's affected by sunlight and uh, and temperature. So everything's connected to everything else is really complicated. But the methane in the permafrost, it's a problem because it is a source of carbon dioxide ultimately. But the methane bomb theory is not something to be concerned with. So one thing that that makes me think of, I, I remember very clearly hearing about the um, the methane bomb yeah. and that um, it wasn't just the methane that was uh, from the permafrost, but also from um, agriculture and, you know, cow farts mm -hmm. and stuff like that. And the cumulative effect is such that it was inevitable right. to have the, the methane bomb go off. Now, the methane from agriculture, that's a whole other thing. <clears throat> which is interesting. And by the way, they belch the methane out. <laughs> okay. That's what, yeah, that's where it comes from. And so, but it, 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 it's just like, you know, anything else, you have to, you have to calibrate correctly. Um, if there weren't cattle, there would be something else eating grass and making some methane. There'd be bison. I mean, it used to be a gazillion bison and now there's a gazillion cow. But the thing is, I'm pretty sure there's a lot more cattle than bison. And the cattle are being their 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 biology is is tuned tuned up, they're ramped up. They're not they're growing faster and so on. So the amount of contribution of methane contribution by our cattle stock and our feed lots, which have their own methane because of just piles of manure and so on, is way higher than the amount that would be there from bison. Right. You still have to subtract the bison because they really did exist and they really were putting the, we were, they were in equilibrium already. So you have to subtract the pronghorn antelopes and the bison, and everything else we removed to replace them with cattle. Um, and it's a problem. And it's one of the reasons to eat less beef, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, and it would be really nice to build. I mean, I, I, in Minnesota, every once in a while, there'll be a really bad smell. And it's so funny because people say, oh yeah, I think there's a farm over there, it's from that. It's like, well, no, actually that farm is now a suburb with all houses in it. It's not It's not from that farm. Oh, it must be some other farm. If you look at a map on those days it smells, you can see the wind streams. It's Nebraska. <laughs> We're not that close to Nebraska. <laughs> I mean, the corner hits, touch, it's, and it's the cattle farms. It, it is so bad. So I think it would be nice if we could find a way of having feedlots that don't put all that methane out. And we can, or, or we capture it. Yeah. And use it for something yeah. useful, you know, make it into hydrogen. I can, I know how that smell is. I live um, in the country, uh, in the mount, kind of almost in the mountains of North Carolina. I'm, I'm a mountain county, but I'm not quite at the top. So, yeah. um, but we have, I mean, I have fields all around me, farmland all around me. And we always know when it's time for them to put the manure down. Right. Or right. whether it's pig farming or cattle or whatever it is, um, it stinks. And you go yeah. through long areas and it's just, oh my gosh, the smell is just atrocious. Um, yeah. it, it's, it's, it's really disgusting. So yeah, I would really love it if we did not have so many people eating, <laughs> eating beef. But um, so I have a few other questions sure. here. Skeptic Haven, probably Wes said, are there effects or dangers on humans or on other primates that we should look for? He says, not sure if that's a good question. Just curious what the future might bring in a lot of time. Effects from global warming? I, I think so, yes. Yeah, I, I think that, um, well, okay, this is interesting because think about how many people, how many, just think about people for a minute. How many people die every year from the cold versus from the heat? And this is one of this one of the anti climate change you know skeptics people. One of their arguments is way more people die of the cold than the heat. Heat's not a big problem, okay? But that's because if the range of temperatures in which we live goes from many degrees below zero, I'm going to use Fahrenheit here, many degrees below zero up to a hundred. Most of those temperatures are colder than our body temperature. Right. Okay. Our body temperature is the high ends of our environmental temperature. Why is that? Why is our body temperature 100, rounding it off slightly? Why is our body temperature several degrees above the usual maximum temperature? Well, for one reason, if it was several degrees below our usual maximum temperature, 
we, it wouldn't have happened. I mean, we wouldn't have, that species would have gone extinct. Mm -hmm. If shedding heat is life and death, and, and our body, if our body temperature was set, our baseline, because we're, we're, we're homeotherms, we keep a steady temperature. If our baseline temperature was 60, we would be extinct because so many days it's above 60, no matter where you are, even in a cold climate, right. you would just die of heat exhaustion. Everybody would die of heat exhaustion. Mm -hmm. So so we are living at our body temperatures at several degrees above our usual high temperature, and we can handle more with sweating and things. So we're biologically able to handle another 10, 15 degrees and not die usually unless you're, unless you're weakened for some other reason. Um, so that's why more people die of cold and heat because we live in an environment where there's more cold and heat on a day-to-day -day basis. As our temperature goes up, there will be places where that temperature every day and every night will be above our body temperature or only a little bit below it at night and quite a few degrees above it during the day. Okay, so in Pakistan, there was an article a few years ago about something going on. I'm sure this is happening in many parts of the world. Uh, Lowland Pakistan, really high, they had really bad heat. The last El Nino or the one before that, they had really bad heat. And they realized, I mean, people were dying. And they went to say, okay, we have to bury the bodies. Well, I'm sorry, but the guy who digs the grave, that's his body. Like people were dying and they were leaving bodies around because they couldn't handle it. So the next so warm season, the grave diggers went out when it was still cool and dug a whole bunch of graves. So as the people died of the next heat wave, they could just put them in the already dug graves. Okay. Wow. That's an adaptation to heat. So I don't want to hear about cold kills more than heat. <laughs> Cause yeah. it, it's it, that. So I think that that's an effect. I think there are places in the world where it's really hard to live because of the heat already. And those areas will expand and people have to move out of those areas. And they're going to move out of those areas into places where other humans live and where other primates live. And this whole, you know, remember the, the film Day After Tomorrow? Mm -hmm. And that. that's that, of course, puts together this whole the Atlantic conveyor, which is current. There's, oh, I can tell you something new about the Atlantic conveyor, too, maybe. But the Atlantic conveyor shuts it down and they all end up moving to Africa. Don't they? In that, is that when I think of a different movie? They, everyone gets on a ship and moves to Africa because Africa is an elephant. That's what it is. It's hard to remember now, but yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it, Africa is an elevated continent. Think about this. Every major river going to Af into Africa, except the Nile, hits a waterfall right away. The Nile goes quite a bit and then hits a waterfall and then like many, many, many waterfalls. So Africa is way up. It's a thousand feet higher than North America, not counting mountains. So it's cooler and it's a bit safer and it's where a lot of people are going to end up. Because all the wow. lowlands are going to be too hot. And the really lowlands are going to be underwater. With, with, right. You know, I mentioned before, when you stop polluting, the temperature stops going up. But the temperature is already currently high enough to predict sea level rise still to still continue. At the current temperature, sea level should be quite a bit higher than it is now. And it's just melting. We don't know how long that will take. My, I have a story I like to tell about that. Um, as a, a parable, like people wonder how how long will it take for the sea level to rise of some level, and it's sort of a joke about three a, a scientist, what is it, a, a, an engineer, a physicist, and a paleoclimatologist go to a wedding because a friend of theirs are getting married, and they walk into the wedding venue and there's a one of those ice swans sitting on a on a table and slowly melting, so they say they start part, part putting bets when will most of the water be on the ground. So the, 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 the engineer gets out his little book of ice swan data and looks up the ice swan and says, oh, tomorrow at 6 a.m. it'll all be on the ground. And the physicist estimates the surface area and the air temperature and does some calculations and says, no, it's going to be by midnight tonight. And the paleoclimatologist says, it could be any second now. And as he says that, the head of the swan falls off, knocks into one of the wings and causes the swan to slide to the edge of the table and just fall off. They said, how did you know that? He said, this isn't my first ice swan. <laughs> Referring to all the glacial melting events we've ever had in the past, you know. Right. We, we know that there have been times in the past when the sea level went up, you know, uh, a couple hundred feet in 30 years. So that's, all those people have to move. Yeah. This is one of the lessons we learned from the, uh, uh, the storm, it was a name storm that was not that was not a hurricane that hit Libya during Libya a few weeks ago. 
and destroyed that city. During it destroyed the town, the city, mm -hmm. pretty much. And what you saw there was a um, that was sea level rise happening in real time. And I remember visiting when I was a little kid. We used to go to Cape Cod and visiting the Marconi station. So Marconi Marconi built a tower, and he had guy wires set at 100 feet. It was a square, 100 feet on the side, with these concrete pillars holding up the guy wires to build this tower to send the first radio transmission to Europe. Okay. And when I was a little kid, we went there and I saw all four of the, of these things, hundred feet apart, a square of hundred feet apart at a slight angle to the ocean. So a hundred foot square. I remember going back there 20 years later and one of them was left. The rest wow. had been moved into the ocean. The ocean had taken a hundred feet laterally of Cape Cod at the seashore. Wow. Wow. Okay. Uh, and big chunks of like 10, 15, 50 of that were in one event or another event. Like there were some big storms. So um, what, when the sea level rise, you're standing, you're at the beach, you go to the beach, and there's the ocean, and you're standing with your feet in the water. Turn around and walk back towards the parking lot or wherever it is you came from. At some point, there'll be an abrupt rise. Almost every beach will have an abrupt rise. Sometimes it might be like the seashore in Cape Cod and it's like 100 feet high. Sometimes it'll be three or four feet high, but there's an abrupt rise right there. And that is the point, that is the land that has been not inundated. And the rise is caused by storms eroding, mm -hmm. right. right? So when you imagine the sea rising a few feet, you don't look at a topographic map and move the line over. Because if that's true, that would be no cliffs ever. If the water just gently went along with the topography, there would be no sea cliffs anywhere. But there are sea cliffs everywhere. Okay. So you stand on now, go back and stand on that cliff, or like stand on the beach and look at the cliff, and the cliff comes to your the top of your head. Turn around, look at the ocean. Now extend from the top of your head out over the ocean. That's the land that the ocean took. And it wow. could go up from where you are. There could be a hill in front of you that the ocean took and goes down. It could be 100 miles before you get to the where the, you know, it drops again. Now, who knows? Depends on what the topography was like. Right. The sea does not go up a foot. And then it's take like a few feet in, like you would see like where the sea is now. It goes in and it carves out miles of landscape in some places. Right. Okay. Right. So you, the, all these ideas when people take the topographic line of where the sea is and, and, and now and then where it would be if it goes up 10 feet, that's not where it's going to be. It's going to be 15 to 100 miles or 200 miles inland farther from that. Missouri, yeah. if we melted every bit of ice, every bit of ice that exists, Missouri will be on the Gulf of Mexico. Well, I, well, first let me say thank you, Dan D, for your $10 super chat. We appreciate you so much. Thank you very much. Um, I want to say I know what you are describing on the coast of North Carolina. Anytime that we have a hurricane come in or anything like that, we have, it's not just like a coast, a line. You right. have all these inlets that go in. And every time that something like that happens and we have massive flooding, when the waters recede, those inlets are much bigger than they were before. And it's right. so you're right. It's like it just carves into it's like uh, like taking a, a scalpel and just carving out pieces. And so it's it's not just that it's gone in, say, four feet. Right. It's gone in probably, you know, two or three miles and expanded those inlets. And there's been a lot of damage. Um, irreparable damage that's occurred on the North Carolina coast because of that. And I know it's up and down the the eastern seaboard, especially. Yeah. Um, so I know exactly what you're what you're talking about. It's, it's quite interesting, quite right. devastating. And now we have we have big news about the Atlantic conveyor. So the Atlantic conveyor is a system that that moves Indian Ocean heat to England. Basically, and, and, and Indian Ocean is a trapped basin. It gets too very hot, and and the, and the heat leaves goes around Africa and goes north in the Atlantic. And then it it distributes across Europe, which is why Europe is warmer than it's supposed to be, right? People think of it as a Gulf Stream, but Gulf Stream is a little tiny piece of this. The Atlantic conveyor, the theory is, is from, again, that movie depicted it inaccurately, but the uh, if you if you add a lot of fresh water to the North Atlantic at once from melting glaciers, um, that will uh, cause the evaporation. The evaporation causes an increase in salinity of the water, which makes it dense so it drops and that's the engine that runs this whole current system that crosses the entire globe and if you add a lot of, salt, of fresh water all at once that'll mix with the salty water and it won't be driving the system anymore and the atlantic of air it turns off 
That's the most extreme scenario. I can tell you right now that simple version of the model isn't accurate. Uh, it's up in the air. There's a lot of research coming out now about the Atlantic conveyor, how it works and what really happened. And people are arguing about it. So we don't really know. But if the Atlantic conveyor, the other thing the Atlantic conveyor does, it and other currents pushes the ocean to a big mound in the middle of the North Atlantic, in the middle of the Atlantic. So the ocean is risen up by this current. If the conveyor shuts down, the ocean flattens out. Where's the water go? Well, sea level rise in the Carolinas might be three or four feet just when that happens. So without adding water to the ocean or adding heat to expand the ocean size, you get three feet of sea level rise in the Carolinas instantly. Yeah. Well, geologically speaking. And that means all, all along the coast of the Carolinas and Virginia and Maryland, the barrier islands, how, how tall are those islands? Like three feet? <laughs> right. <laughs> they might be six feet in some spots, but if you raise the ocean three feet, they're just gone. They're, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yep, Chicken absolutely. Tea, you know, yeah. Which may, now, and then, um, of course, yeah, exposes the seashore. Yeah. Um, I know it's getting close to the top of the hour. Um, are you able to stay for just a little bit longer? Oh, sure. I, if, if you're not able to, that's fine. But um, there's still okay. a couple more questions that we hadn't even touched on your articles yet. Well, we kind of did the Libya. We um, did a little bit, yeah. But really quickly, uh, we are having an upcoming fundraiser. We are trying to become a 501c3. And so I would like, Wes, if you can play our promo for our upcoming Halloween fundraiser. Join us for our Halloween special, a fundraiser to help Skeptic Haven become a charity organization. Skeptic Haven provides a healthy community and safe space to its members. In addition, producing shows that provide informative videos highlighting science, religion, and current events, both domestic and abroad. Please join us the evening of October 28th for our first Halloween fundraiser to get funds for our 501c3 and other expenses. We have many well-known YouTube content creators coming on. Come join in the fun. Are you ready for the show? <laughs> we're really excited. It's going to be a great night and um, we're, just, we're just going to have a great time. It does cost money, time and effort to become a 501c3, uh, but we are wanting to create a, a safe place for, um, you know, for skeptics and free thinkers and science buffs and all that kind of stuff. And so um, please help us with that. All right, moving on, we do have a question here, and it dealt with uh, our conversation from a little bit earlier. If the cows ate grass versus corn, would that make any difference? Okay, I don't, I'm not sure about that. Um, if you eat it, okay, if they, the, what they're getting now, which includes heavy doses of antibiotics, which is not designed to, has some kind of growth hormone effect on them, I think. And if you didn't feed them the way they're fed now, which includes a really high quality feed, they would grow less quickly. But um, there is this idea of putting, adding the seaweed into their diet that changes the dynamics, that changes the enzymes or something in their gut. So they produce way less methane. Um, and that actually apparently works. Of course, then we have a new industry, which then gets to ruin the ocean by taking all this kelp out from somewhere. And you need a lot of it. Apparently, I, apparently we need a lot of it. It would take, and it has to be shipped from the ocean into the, you know, to Nebraska, wherever the cows are and the cattle are. So, but it's an idea. The thing is, to me, if there's an enzyme you can add to their diet that reduces their, their methane, how hard is it going to be to come up with a way of bioengineering bacteria to produce that enzyme in large quantities right. and just fix this problem? Right. Yep. So. Absolutely. And, and the fact that it hasn't been fixed already makes me wonder if it's if it's real. But it mm -hmm. seems like it could be. Like I don't know much about that, but yes, there's it's an interesting idea. It also has to do with whether or not it makes anybody money or if it cuts into their profits. Right. Because anything yeah. that, that doesn't matter what it does to us, how beneficial it would be, profits are where it's at, unfortunately. So but, but I would think there would be a well, yeah, what's what's the benefit to a farmer? to do this there probably isn't one but if it was if it was required to have your cattle right i mean i don't know this is where this is where, this is where good government can do a good thing well thank you lena dill hates the clock for that question and another one from probably west 
Um, what about the 80,000 year cycle? What can we expect in the future and the effect on this cycle? I'm not sure what the 80,000 year cycle is exactly. Are we talking about the Blankovich cycles? I don't know. Um, I don't know what it what. Wes, if yeah. you want to come back on oh, yeah. another. He's probably, another... yeah, if that's Wes, he's talking about the Milankovitch cycle. So um, there is there is a general, because of the way the Earth, you know, the Earth is tilted and the Earth is in an eccentric orbit, an oval instead of a circle. Mm -hmm. And the sun is at one of the two foci of that oval. And so summer, just imagine summer, the, the, the peak, the, June 22nd. If, if the earth is, the earth changes how much is tilted. So if the earth is tilted more towards the sun than it usually is during the northern summer, and the northern summer occurs when the earth is as close to the sun as it ever gets on that e elliptical orbit, mm -hmm. then that'll be a really warm summer for thousands of years. Then it shifts so it can be tilted away more, tilted, less tilted towards the sun. And the summer moments happen when the Earth is as far away as it could possibly be. That's going to be a very cool summer for thousands of years. Now, that means that if the CO2 level, let's we'll assume CO2 is a major greenhouse gas that then regulates vapor. Um, the CO2 is down around 200, 250 parts per million. And that occurs, there will be ice ages. It, it isn't, it, it, ice ages, we don't know how ice ages start, but there's all kinds of theories. But basically... You have a really a number of really bad. Imagine Canada having snow that just gets more snow than usual, and the snow happens later than usual that year. So you get some of these June snowstorms over large areas. So the summer just never really gets that warm, and some of that snow doesn't quite melt. And you have an early early winter. If both those things happen in one year, that snow that didn't melt, gee, that's a glacier. That's a baby glacier, right? That's a glacier yeah. embryo, right? And that's going to reflect the sun. So it, that location will be cooler all summer, the next summer, because there's ice on it. And that's how you get a glacier to start. But it won't happen when the earth is typically being extra warm by the sun, as opposed to extra cooled, being farther away. Right. Those cycles don't matter when the atmospheric CO2 is up to 400. Gotcha. It'll just be warm. It won't be. A, so um, it's, it's, um, so that's, that's what's going on there. So, we are probably about 320 parts per million to 350 parts per million is a cutoff point between having a glacial periods and not having glacial periods. So we're way beyond the point now where we're likely to have the Pleistocene is over because of our inserting CO2 into the atmosphere. And it may well be if we stop putting CO2 into the atmosphere, if we electrify everything and decarbonize our electricity and stop messing with our carbon sinks and methane sinks, we're going to have to actually later, like 500 years from now, we might want to add CO2 to the atmosphere just to avoid a Pleistocene in glaciation. And I'm sure we can figure out a way to do that, just burn stuff. So I want to add, this may be a really stupid question, but I've, I have heard um, people ask this question, so I'm going to ask it for anyone that might want to know. When we're talking about climate change going up two degrees or three degrees right. or four degrees, um, what exactly is that talking about? Because, um, you know, people will say, well, uh, we go up and down degrees all the time through seasonal changes. And we talked about what climate is to begin with the climate change and how that's different. We're talking about over a long period of time. Can you talk about the degrees and how that what, what we're talking about when we say that that the climate has the climate has actually risen two degrees or three degrees? Right. It's a little bit like having, uh, there's a couple things that happen because of the nature, because of the nature of clouds and, and vapor and winds and trade winds and the, way, the nature of how winds move around the earth and so on during, during we, we, there's sort of, see, there seems to be a threshold effect that happens when you reach a certain degree of warming, it changes the nature of cells of air that encircle our planet that are above and below the atmosphere. No, so the things, the things that, that determine trade winds, the things that determine the gesture. Mm -hmm. There's a threshold effect that happens when you reach a certain point where that dynamic changes significantly and you end up with 
both heat and water clumping. So you can have extreme heat waves in a small area like Europe, relatively small area, gets an extreme heat wave that runs for a few months where you can get uh, rain systems. And this is something we're so used to now, we don't even pay much attention to it. But some 10 years ago, I think it was in Calgary, Canada, there was a rainstorm that showed up and it rained for like seven days and it dumped eight inches of rain or so on the ground and flooded it terribly. And everyone was like, why did that happen? Well, the Gulf, the, um, the, the jet stream stalled for some reason. The jet stream got all curvy and then didn't move. It got curvy, so it's bringing cold and moist and hot and cool air all together in one place, and it's not moving. It's supposed to be fluctuating a bit and just sits there and creates this stormy system that normally would just move across the continent. It just sits there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, then a few weeks later, it happened again in Denver. Then a few weeks later, it happened again in or a couple of months later in China. Then it hit Hungary and Poland. And over that first year or two, we had passed the threshold. And now we have this all the time. Right. It's either a drought for a couple of years or a rainstorm for a few weeks. And that's that's different. That's not what happens when the temperature when the temperature reaches a certain point, it changes the configuration of the atmosphere, and that happens mm -hmm. right away. Okay. And and the temperature, the temperature is a little bit hard to explain. The temperature, I, I'd like to think of it as as changing from I, I cook, I, I I make soup, and I might boil some eggs, and I make oatmeal. To I'm deep fat frying things and um, that sort of stuff where now we've gone to the point where a little hot, a boiling water in my hand is not going to hurt me that much, but oil is going to give me a third degree burn and it could catch on fire. Right. It isn't yeah. that much of a difference. My overall apartment, the place I live here, it doesn't change the temperature that much, but going from boiling water to cooking oil locally is enough to cause a disaster locally. Right. You know, so the, the, yeah. it's really easy to see these as small numbers because yeah, the temperature varies way more than that day to day. But it changes the fundamental nature of our climate. Just look at the difference between between the, the climate of Maine and North Carolina. Mm -hmm. It's only a couple hundred miles away. But it's quite extensive. <laughs> yes. and, 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 and these zones are based upon only as tiny differences in temperatures locally. Mm -hmm. And you get enough to have a completely different climate. In the bar. Although actually where you live is probably closer to Maine because you're in an elevated area. You have pine trees, right? right? But yes. anyway. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so that really segues well, because I really, before you go, I wanted to talk about your articles. The first one, mm -hmm. which is really going along the lines of what we just talked about. Um, you wrote an article for The Messenger, which is titled, What Did We Learn from Hurricane Idalia? So I want to talk about that. Yeah. Did you have a specific question or you want me to just talk? Well, you can go ahead and talk. Okay. I, I was just thinking about how um, in the very beginning of the article, you uh, you wrote that you know, the that hurricane very quickly went to a I believe it was a category four if I'm not mistaken yeah it hit four and I think yeah that that used to happen kind of sporadically rarely it wasn't something that we saw that that rapid uh, uh, intensification right but now we see it all the time yes um, that's kind of where I wanted to go with that yeah I think it was Katrina in 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 the Atlantic system it was Katrina. That was the first hurricane that people really noticed. It it went from a three to a five or something as it passed over this really warm spot in the Gulf and went boom. And then it was actually weakened a little bit before it hit the coast. And people were like, that was fast. But then a few years ago, it started happening. The, the, uh, I can't remember. I was going to look up the hurricane names before this, but I forgot to. I was actually, I got distracted by a really weird <laughs> bird is what happened. I was out walking <laughs> and with a friend and we found this, a species of bird that doesn't exist here was running around. So we had to oh, wow. that. That's cool. anyway, an escapee. Anyway, um, uh, there was a hurricane that was off the coast of, Florida, of uh, Mexico in the in the Eastern Pacific that was small. It went from a storm to hurricane in hours, got up to like category three or four really fast and it just ran, slammed into Mexico, but in a place where like hardly anybody lived. So it didn't have any, it wasn't a big news story, but it intensified faster than anyone ever seen it before. The next year, so we had those big hurricanes coming across Cuba and after, over the last few years, we had hurricanes coming across the uh, Dominican Republic, Haiti, Cuba, Jamaica, and into Florida or near Florida again and again and again. And many of those intensified really fast. It really used to be, not that it was rare, it just didn't happen. And the reason it doesn't happen is because a, as a hurricane strengthens, it 
destroys the heat source that is strengthening it because it mixes the water underneath it. Right. Okay. But now the hurricane, so there's like a hurricane level threshold of temperature, like the high 80s, that used to be the top 10 meters or five to 10 meters of, of ocean. Now it's the top 100 meters. Right. So if there's no shortage of heat at all. So a factor that always mitigates is a hurricane is always a matter of things making it into a hurricane, things destroying it as a hurricane, back and forth, different kinds of currents and air currents and, and temperature effects. And this one thing that used to be an attenuating effect in hurricanes simply doesn't happen anymore over large areas of the ocean. So in those areas, the hurricanes are not slowed down by that. So they just get bigger, faster. Like right. It's just routine now. Um, so which means, among other things, sometimes it means you don't have the evacuation time or it gets stronger than you than it was than you might have expected it to and it's really amazing to think i don't remember the numbers but the number of people that died people probably know this online in the galveston hurricane it was like oh. thousands and thousands of people died because nobody knew it was coming and it was a big hurricane that flooded and people had built homes and places that were stupid and they didn't see it coming and they just got wiped out. It was the worst hurricane disaster ever. The same hurricane hitting an area now wouldn't have be anywhere nearly as bad because we see them coming. We have a good system. And there was a period of time, Andrew was, I think was an example where people, oh, I don't care. Hurricanes. We had lots of hurricanes in Florida. We don't care. We're not going to bother evacuating. And then you get killed, right? So there were high death rates with Katrina because people were poor and couldn't be, nobody really tried them too hard. And Andrew, people didn't care. Those hurricanes, that, that was a period of hurricanes when more people died than should have because people were cynical or not prepared, but we knew they were coming. And then after that, it's been really easy. We've had worse and worse hurricanes, but but people are evacuating and we're, we're handling them. Now, all of a sudden, they're, produced, they're, they're going up to, up to large size in hours or a day instead of a week. We're back to that earlier stage where they become super dangerous again. Right. And then we actually had one off the coast of North Carolina form. We, they knew that it was coming. They said it was going to be, um, Oh, what a depression or something. We're right before it becomes an actual tropical storm. Yeah. And they said it might, we don't know. It might actually reach the level of a tropical storm, but it shouldn't do much because they called it a homegrown storm where it's so close to the coast, um, that it just probably will not be anything, but it, it intent it didn't get major, I'm, you know, but it did mm -hmm. intensify much quicker than they thought, and it went up towards uh, was it Maine and 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 that area. Um, right before that, there was another storm that lasted in, uh, you know, it came off of Africa and then it kind of just sat there and it became a really really intense storm. Thankfully, it didn't move very fast, mm -hmm. and by the time it came to you know close to the to the coast. Um, well, it actually ended up being a, a fish storm because it curved up, but it had the wind shear from a, a front coming through right. that allowed it to kind of go. But if it had moved faster, if it would have just moved faster, it could have been very devastating. Those right. are the things that I've been seeing a lot lately. Yeah. And you're talking about just this year, right? Yes. Yeah. Not that long ago, <laughs> just yeah. within yeah. the last few weeks. Yeah, we've had some pretty impressive storms already this year. I don't know if it's going to be a bigger year than. Well, the other, the other thing is people were expecting with climate change. There was a paper that came out that said um, oh, we might have fewer hurricanes rather than more or smaller hurricanes, maybe more of them, but smaller ones in the Atlantic with global warming. And the same research ideas gave the idea that El Nino's. We're going to have fewer bad hurricanes in El Nino's than we do in La Nina's, which is historically true. We're in an El Nino year now. We're having some pretty impressive hurricanes. Mm -hmm. So that whole idea kind of went away. The idea is obviously going to have more energy, more storminess, but it won't get organized. Because the same kind of these same effects that give you more energy create more things that break down hurricanes. Apparently, we need to rethink our hurricane science a little bit because in a warming world in El Nino, we're having really impressive hurricanes anyway. Mm -hmm. So one of the lessons of, of Idalia was the, the speed up. A another is, though, a good news is <clears throat> that we it was a bad hurricane and it did really bad damage, but people were paying attention to it and they did get out of the way. I do know this guy who is a couple who 
um, moved to her. You're going to like this. They moved to Florida because it wasn't, they were tired of Minnesota because Minnesota was too woke. <laughs> so they moved to Florida. Like it. They, they, they bought a piece of property yeah. in Florida. And right after they bought it, before they moved there, it was destroyed by a hurricane a couple of years ago. And then they rebuilt it. That's not it. funny, but oh my gosh. It Sorry, is funny. go ahead. These are people who are very able to do, like they're, they know how to do construction. Right, they know how to build stuff. So they went down to just rebuild their house right away, and then they finally moved down there, and it got hit by this last hurricane. Okay. They're in that area, so um, it, it, that's happening. That's going to happen. You know, we're going to have. I mean, if we have more hurricanes, it's going to be more. And they stopped insuring places in Florida now. Uh huh. Absolutely. I don't know the details of that, but. Um, well, they. I mean, Florida does get quite a few uh, now. I lived in Florida for a little while. Um, I moved from North Carolina down to Florida and then back up because I'm, I'm smarter than uh, to, you know, just, <laughs> than to stay there. But um, anyway, I know that what we used to have is hurricane parties. I mean, people, like you said, they were so used to hurricanes right. coming through. And, and even the worst, unless you were down at the Keys, they weren't all that bad. Right. Oh, that bad. Well, you, uh, they're not that yeah. way anymore. They are some massive devastation. It it yeah. kind of goes through and curves. At, oh my gosh, it, it could be terrible, really terrible. Yeah. John, there, I think it was John McDonald wrote the novel Condominium. Hmm. So it was written. It was probably written in the seventies, and it was about her complacency over hurricanes. So people were having hurricane. It was a hurricane coming. Okay, people built a condominium on the barrier beach. It was might have been in Florida, might have been in Carolinas. I don't know. I don't remember. And they, it, and there was co uh, corruption among the contractors and the real estate people. So it was about that. The condominium was built incorrectly. The, the foundation was incorrect. And then the hurricane came, and everybody didn't care about the hurricane coming. So they had a party in the top floor of the condominium. Of course, the hurricane came in, flooded the bay behind the barrier beach, and then the new the new outlet from the lagoon became where the condominium was, which a geologist character knew was going to happen. You know, etc. Mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a. It, it was made into a. It was a TV. I mean, it was a, a movie, probably starring Ernest Borgnine. <laughs> it's one of those disaster movies. Kind yeah, of. I Look loved it up. Ernest Borgnine. I'm yeah. sorry. That. <laughs> yeah. Look it up. But it, it was a really early version of this whole story of you know corruption and and hurricanes and 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 complacency and weather and everything else. Kind of a fun story. I read it when I was a kid. That's how old um, it is. I may have seen it. I loved Ernest Borgnine. And so wasn't he also in, what was that movie? The one where the ship was upside down? Yeah, the Poseidon Adventure. Poseidon and, Adventure, And, yes. and is it Shelley Winters? Oh, yes. Shelley That's Winters. The, I like, yeah. It's in all those, yeah. Yeah. Yep. So, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have to look that up. And um, I'm showing my age now. <laughs> That's okay. I'm just, um, so the, yeah, okay. Really kind, kind of Medium was a film, but Ernest Borgnine was not actually in it. I oh, just looked it up. Okay. Well, he was in so many of those disaster yeah. type movies that um, I'm surprised. But anyway, uh, before before we close up, I wanted to also touch, we kind of touched on it a little bit earlier. You were talking about um, how in uh, the storm that hit Libya, the, the sea mm -hmm. rose really quickly. And that was another article that you wrote for The Messenger. Mm -hmm. It was titled, Libya's Deadly Disaster Shows Sea Level Rise is not a slow creeping threat. And I wanted right. to touch on that really quickly. Yeah, it, it is like this idea that sea level rises up and slowly takes over the land. Anybody actually spent any time in the ocean knows that storms are what shapes the ocean. Mm -hmm. And um, you can, you can I, I live near the ocean a lot and I've always, you know, it's always fun to go down after a big storm, you go to the ocean, you watch the waves and you see what they do. And it's just amazing to see what happens there. So I mentioned the the well fleet, you know, the Marconi station is 100 feet of, of several storms away. Mm -hmm. um, uh, that area of Cape Cod, the outer part of the Cape, you know, the part that's the upper arm of the Cape is, is mm -hmm. essentially an island now. Um, it would it wouldn't it is not because they keep rebuilding the little section that connects it. But when there's high water storms, it just breaks off and it's separate. Um, it's, it's the storms that do that. And it's not it's not. First of all, we may have we may have fits and starts. We may have sea level rise happening quickly. So here's a scenario, for example, in the Antarctic, those big ice sheets that keep breaking off. We hear about it in the news, mm -hmm. like the Larsen ice sheet and so on. 
that doesn't matter too much because those are just ice floating in the ocean. So it doesn't change the sea level when they break off and float away. But they are holding back river ice rivers that are going up through these valleys in Antarctica. And if you go up the valley, if you if you like go, if you went under under the ice and like could somehow survive there, you'd be under the ice, the ice would be just off your head, and you go up and there'd be a solid wall of rock below and ice above. Now, if you are a Minecraft player, you go into spectator mode and you so you pass through the rock and the ice and you come out and you're in water again. And ice is above you. This river of ice, this glacier is now above you and underneath it is water. So you keep going and there's a river of water underneath the ice for some miles. And then you end up with just rock with the ice on top of it. OK, so there's a grounding line sitting there that's called of, of, of rock that is holding back the ice. And the ice is slowed down from its journey over the grounding line by the uh, by the ice sheet that's out in the ocean. Then, if you take that river of water of ice, it is flanked on both sides by mountains of ice. Mm -hmm. It's like the glacier is there, this big glacier. It's just a river that's lower down. So my question is, if that grounding line breaks up and the river moves, how fast will the ice move out into the ocean? And then what happens to the mountains on the side, which are being held up by it? How fast do they fall in? Yeah. And I've asked, I, I write some, wrote something about this several a couple years ago, and there's turns out that there's two schools of thought. And one school of thought says it's going to be really, it's, it's going to take like that process right there to raise the sea level a foot, like but from one big glacier, a couple of glaciers, like a thousand, two thousand, three thousand years. Um, and that was all by younger scientists who are pretty much not field workers or modeling science people. Then I went to the guy, Richard Alley, who's like Mr. Ice, who's the guy who's out on the glaciers. He's retired now, um, but he's like the grand master of ice. And and I said, his first answer to me was, I have no idea. And like, he's the world's expert. I have no idea. And then I asked for like the range. And does the range include the sea level going up like really fast? They said, oh, totally. But we don't know, but it could because we don't know what happens when you expose cliffs of ice of these. We don't know what happens. We've never seen it. We don't know what, how did they do they fall into the river go down right away. So sea level can rise quicker than people might think. And that'll be a big surprise when it happens. And then when the sea level rises, all it does is just make the beach a little bit less over those days it's rising or weeks or months it's rising. But when the hurricane comes in, it just that's what it the hurricane that's when the ocean takes what's due to it. It's like right. a big IOU. Every 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 piece of of sea of, of seashore right now owes the ocean. A whole bunch of like you said before about the in, in the Carolinas, these things forming. These the, the the ocean has a debt owed to it by the land right now, almost yeah. everywhere. And, and and all it takes is a storm to come and collect on that debt. Yep. And it'll be it's and what we saw in Libya was an example of that where huge amounts of land were just taken and now it's part of the Mediterranean. Forever. Yep. Until you know. Yeah, there's nothing you could I mean you can you can't like move enough dirt in to, to recreate that it's just not possible right i mean so. they, they could do some major thing in this really poor country this really poor town they could bother they could do they could build the land up again or something i suppose but yeah it's just going to happen again downstream somewhere and and that was a small storm compared right. to a hurricane in the mediterranean which is a very you know not and of course we're seeing more storms in the mediterranean but yeah that's that's the idea is it's not and I, this is something i've been aware of for a long time and i remember I was actually in Texas, but there's a storm that came through in 1978 or nine that took out 100 houses on Cape Cod, put them wow. in the ocean, put 200 houses on Cape Cod into the ocean. And it it um, affected Long Island. It was called the Great Storm of 78 or the Great Storm of 79, whatever. It was, around, it was in early January. And um, that storm came across the U.S. and it froze Texas. And uh, I was, that's where I was. I was stuck in like an ice storm in Texas for a week. And, um, and it, it did all this major work, work. And if you look at, if you just look at New England and look at storminess prior to that year, like for the 650s, 60s and 70s, there's a certain level that storms got to. And after that year, it's there's the storm, the typical amount of rain coming in the larger storms is 300% larger now. So, we're just in a period of more storminess and it's gotten more so in the last decade. And that's been years ago. So it, the edge of the sea is basically a big bank and the sea is coming to take its withdrawals. Oh, 
I have so many more things I want to say, but I know that we we've gone a half hour over, and, and I want to thank you for staying and and allowing us to go off on on all of these conversations. But I really wanted to hit your um, your articles, and and people can find them there linked um, in the show description. So please check that out, everyone. Um, really quickly, I want to thank our patrons: Sydney Davis Jr. Jr., Erica Zoles, Ryan, Denise Murphy, Dan D, Michael Wiseman. Kathy Cotton, Cindy Plaza, me, Sunny Shell, Aaron Colson, Phil Calderon, and Amanda McLeod. So thank you guys so much. We really, really appreciate your help. Um, I, you know, maybe I should send out like a challenge uh, that you know uh, maybe we can get two more patrons by the time we have our show next. And all you got to do is give a dollar or two dollars a month, and that makes a big difference for us. All right. I want you to not forget about our other shows on Skeptic Haven. We have Secular Soapbox on Wednesdays, Thursdays here at the Sunny Spot. Saturday, we have two great shows. We have The Global Atheist and we have Women Atheist Unload. I'm also on that show sometimes. And then our newest show, which I love, is Let's Talk on Sunday. And I'm there every once in a while as well, where you can call in and you can talk to us about anything you want to. It's a safe place for people who are in the process of deconverting, have deconverted, or you want to ask us, ask an atheist something, and you're a religious person. So uh, we just, we absolutely love that. So support, support us, support what you believe in, become a patron by going to patreon.com slash skeptic haven. Do you have any final thoughts for us? No, I just want to say thank you for this work you're doing. I've, I've done a few shows. I've seen a few shows. And I think what you're doing here is really great. I really appreciate the fact that you're doing it. We need to have, somebody just commented, mainstream media needs to cover these topics you cover more. I disagree. I think you just have to become, oh. ma- you have to become mainstream media. Yeah, that's right. You have to become mainstream media because they're not going to do it anyway. Yeah, that's so, true. That's yeah. true. We, are, I think that we're, we're better than mainstream media because they're looking for, um, you know, more ways to make money and, and they're owned by different conglomerates and, we're bringing on the experts and having a real life discussion, you know, among people. So I think it's, I think it's great too. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for being a part of this and for coming on today. A great, great topic. And you're so much fun to have on. Uh, So for everyone out there, um, please check us back out next Thursday. We have all kinds of great people that are coming on, but in the meantime, remember to always think, critically. Good night, everybody. Our being knows this is where we came from. We long to return. And we can, because the cosmos is also within us. We're made of star stuff. We are a way for the cosmos to know itself. If we are not able to ask skeptical questions, to interrogate those who tell us that something is true, to be skeptical of those in authority, then we're up for grabs for the next charlatan, political or religious who comes ambling along.